setting up your meeting for Facebook Live. All right, we are live, Mr. Crabtree. Welcome to my podcast. This is not a Scott cast. Um, Adam Cra Crabtree is the author of multiple books about um, dis dis uh, dissociative identity disorder. Um, this one is called Multiple Man, Exploration and Possession and Multiple Personality. Um, from, from Mesmer to Freud, Magnetic Sleep and the Roots of Psychological Healing. And then you have this other book, Animal Magnetism, Early Hypnotism, and Physical Research. And Psychical, psychical Research, yeah. Okay. So um, how long have you been working in this field, Adam? A little over 50 years. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. Um, what, what originally garnered your interest? What, what led you to working in this field? Well, I come from Minnesota originally. I live in Toronto now for a half or 50 years. <clears throat> um, when I came from Minnesota, I was a member of a monastery in Minnesota called St. John's Abbey. And I, I was a Catholic priest. I came to Toronto to study to get a degree in philosophy, get a, first of all, a master's in philosophy. And then the idea was that I would go on and get a PhD elsewhere. Um, but instead I stayed in Toronto and um, I eventually left the monastery and in other words, stopped practicing as a priest also and got involved in doing psychotherapy. So my main profession has been psychotherapy. Okay, that's really interesting that you left um, religion and you left the monastery to pursue a career in psychology and psychotherapy. Yeah. Yes, I did. Did, uh, did the monastery and the, the, what you were doing have any direct effect on, on that decision? Yes, it did. I, I found that uh, the things that I wanted to do, I could not do while I was in the monastery because <clears throat> I realized more and more, I was a, quite a young man at the time, but the, my real interest is, was in people and um, what's going on within human beings. And <clears throat> although it would be certainly something you can continue to study when you're a monk, particularly because my monastery had uh, run a university or runs a university, and uh, so there would be places to teach, uh, it was the depth of the human being that I wanted to explore, and that was not really possible to emphasize in those days. The depth of human existence, the depth of human meaning, and what it is that we are manifesting as human beings in the world. Okay. So you felt that the, the monastery and the, the Catholic was uh, limiting to that yes. pursuit? That's right. Okay. Okay. That makes sense because with, within that school of thought, things are so rigid and they're very much, this is the way that things are. Um, so for you to step out of that box is kind of taboo. Yeah, it, it, it was necessary for me. I had to. I didn't realize it at the time. It was later that I discovered how much I was in a box and had always been in a box in the, in the various, um, well, you might say, human communities that I was involved in, uh, beginning with the family, then the, the local community that I grew up in in Minnesota, and then the university which is a community in its own right. And the monastery, which is a community also. These are all places where people get together with a particular purpose in mind. And then there are certain expectations and rules that apply if you're going to be a part of it. And those rules were too restrictive for me. And as I later um, realized also unethical, mostly because it wasn't they didn't arise from a deep understanding of, of human beings and their natural um, energy and, and their natural desire for creating things in the world. Do you think that the uh, 
the Catholic Church and the Catholic way of thinking is dangerous to human evolution because of that? Well, that's a tough question. <clears throat> I think that the Catholic Church is actually dangerous in many ways, but in most, most importantly, in terms of the anti-natural ideas that have originally formed it in the early centuries, and the way those ideas have been developed over the centuries since then, particularly ideas that uh, degrade women, ideas that degrade sexuality, ideas that want to limit freedom to things that you're spoon-fed. Right. Those are some of the main things that I think are, are bad for society. But um, I can only speak for myself and know that I couldn't stay within that framework. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. You can only speak for yourself. But um, I do see the correlation between what you're saying and uh, the broader scope of things as far as that, that indoctrination and that rigid set of values being threatening or dangerous to uh, consciousness evolution. Yeah, I would say so. Yes, I would agree with that. Um, so, Adam, I found you, I, I didn't read any of your books yet. I found you because I read this really interesting article on Scientific America, I believe, called Could Multiple Personality Disorder Explain Life, the Universe, and Everything? Yes. Could it? No. No? <laughs> no cannot. Um, one of the things that I would have to say, since I, I was just one of the authors of the book, of, of that article, um, that would not that article title would not describe my thinking personally, but there are certain aspects to the main author's thinking that I agreed with, and that's why I partook in the article itself. <coughs> but no, multiple personality. As a matter of fact, the study of the unconscious, which I think was a great step forward in Western society when the unconscious came forward as a dynamic entity that would explain a lot of the things that we feel and do, even though I believe that, I also believe that the explanation is extremely shallow and doesn't do justice to human depth. Okay. That is by the explanation, I mean the explanation of psychoanalysis and psychodynamic psychotherapy, even though that's what I practice. Right, right. Okay. So um, you're saying your interest is more with the un unconscious, right? Yes, the unconscious though, with my own meaning of the word, I, I'm really putting aside that use of the word, I don't use it anymore in terms of describing my own views. My own views are that things about human beings should be, are much more fruitfully described in terms of depth. Okay. And unconscious is not adequate because a lot of what goes on in the depths of us is conscious or can be made conscious. So it's not a very helpful word anymore. Okay, okay. That's interesting. Um, you're really interested with like trance states and hypnosis. Yes. Um, I guess that has to do with this interest and in depth that you have? It is. I mean, I when I went into therapy myself a long time ago, uh, my therapist used hypnosis with me as part of the therapy. So I've always used it myself with my clients because it gives people a greater access to things that are going on in, in the inner world or their inner mind more, much more than when they are in their ordinary state. So I find it very useful psychotherapeutically with people. And I continue to use it extensively today in psychotherapy. Okay, okay, that's interesting. Um, I wanted to talk more about that article uh, so you were not the main author of that article, correct? No, that's Who right. was? Um, Castro is his name. Bernard Castro. Castro. And the other gentleman that was involved with that article. Ed, Ed were, Kelly. Ed Kelly. You two work closely together, don't you? Yes. We've uh, participated in the protect, production of two books at Esalen Center in, uh, in California, in Big Sur in California. We belong for over 15 years to a seminar there it was called the survival seminar which examined the issue of the survival of death and what can be said about the survival of death so we had a group of people that gathered 
once or twice a year to talk about that. And uh, two books came out of that, that particular work of that seminar. Um, one is called Irreducible Mind. And that lead author of that was Ed Kelly, who's the person you mentioned. And the other is Beyond Physicalism, where it was edited by three people, myself, Ed Kelly, but Ed Kelly's still the main editor of that one. Okay. And um, we do two different things. In, in Irreducible Mind, we're examining the history of how the mind has been uh, sort of left out over the last hundred years in the understanding of the nature of human beings. And it's been a turn towards materialism, a turn towards the explanation of, of, of uh, life and people and actions in deterministic ways. And so this book was to show, show how this is ha has happened and how there's a mass of research in psychical research and other areas that show that simply makes it impossible to accept that explanation of human life. Okay. <laughs> It's almost impossible to accept a lot of uh, interpretations of the human mind just because there's so many and they're so vast, all of them. Yes, and they're all wrong. They're all <laughs> wrong in this sense. You can't explain the human mind. You right. can't explain human depth. We never will be able to explain it. All we can do is explore it. We can describe our own experiences of it. Um, I'm writing a book right now in which one of the main ideas is that we should all become naturalists, that is, natural historians of science. See, the naturalists in the last century, or I should say in the 19th century, <laughs> were people who, uh, they loved to, they were curious about nature, they were curious about living things. And so they had leisure, and they used that leisure to study living things, but they did it in a very simple way. Uh, they would, for instance, go out in their backyards and watch birds or look at the insects or see how plants behave and think about this and draw, make drawings of it, um, describe the different aspects of it and the differences between individuals within a species and things like that. This is what is called uh, a natural history of things, where you're, you're making observations about nature and you're recording them. And that is one of the most fruitful things that we can do as human beings is make observations about nature, about things that exist around us and record them. Now, eventually these records that they produce, they usually collected species of things too, like butterflies and so forth. Eventually those became a part of a, what we would call more of a hard science today where you're studying things in the laboratory and you have double blind experiments and that sort of thing. This is before that, but it prepared the ground for it. It gave a tremendous amount of data, put a tremendous amount of data into circulation, which was a boon for what would eventually become a future science of biology, physics, and so forth. Now, I think we're at the same point in the development of the human race right now I think that we are, however, what we're looking at is not, we can't go out into the backyard or into the fields. We could do that, but that's been done pretty well and it's and is being done. What we need to do is explore the experiences that we have, explore the mental, emotional depth experiences that human beings have and describe them as these natural scientists, as these naturalists describe what they saw around them, we need to describe what we see within us, ourselves, our own experiences, and gather a mass of data of that kind, which can lead to a future science. So you're saying, so almost we should keep like a, a journal of ourselves, but almost in a scientific manner? That's what I would hope. When I, I would not say should, nobody is compelled to do that. No <laughs> right. one could say that, that, you know, everybody must do this. But if we're going to progress as a race, if we're going to evolve and actually realize our potentials, then I think the best way, best starting point is to become naturalists in regard to our own experiences and, and describe all of our experiences 
not only those that are, uh, let's say, approved by a religion or approved by a society, but all the experiences and describe them as they happen and not censor that, not distort it because it doesn't fit into some preconceived ideas and so forth, but just take things as they come and describe them. That would make us naturalists of the human mind or the human um, being. I like that. And as a comedian and a writer, I'm, uh, I, I'm at liberty to agree with that. <laughs> I'm sure. Yes. Yes. You, you have to observe. And you're, you, you observe best if, you, if your prejudices don't come in and block things from you and block your expression of what you're observing. Right. And by prejudices, uh, a lot of people, you could interpret that as like ego, right? It could be that prejudices can come from anywhere. Whenever human beings combine into communities, then they, those communities form expectations of their members and rules that their members are supposed to, supposed to adhere to. And right. so our prejudices are basically those rules and those expectations which the various communities we've been a part of have instilled in us. Those are right. prejudices. So they're born out of social constructs. Yes, yes. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit. You were talking about working with people that have had like near-death experiences. Yes. Um, so were you guys, I know this is like a different field. Were you able to study like their, um, their, some people believe like Dr. Rick Strassman believes that DMT is released from your uh, pineal gland upon death. Um, were people when talking about their near death experiences was, were there a lot of overlaps with their stories and their experiences? Now, are you talking about the group I was involved with in California? Yes. When you say, okay, um, I haven't done much studying of, of near-death experiences myself. There are people in that group who are, who are top experts in that field precisely. Um, but I believe that near-death experiences are important factors, or important, I shouldn't say, I should say experiences. I think they're important experiences. And the more we can find out about how people actually have them in detail, the better off we'll be. But we don't have any way, any way at all yet to actually understand what they are or what produces them. We don't have explanations of the background stuff that's making those things happen. Right, right. You know, people are, have many theories about that. And some of them, as you, you were saying, might be biological, chemical theories. But none of those things really explain that. Right. If you get, if you look or recall experiences that you have had, your some of the most powerful inner experiences. There's nothing on earth that can explain that sufficiently. It can't explain it exhaustively. You can say certain things about it by observing it or by describing it, but it'll never exhaust the real richness of that simple experience. I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, especially as someone who's done copious amounts of psychedelics and had very uh, <laughs> uh, right. prophetic experiences or uh, um, you start getting hit with waves of like just knowledge, uh, uh, epiphanies. So, yeah. uh, yeah. Uh, so and, I, how, and you can never explain those things or describe, even describe those things. Now, right. Language. Explain them. There is a language barrier for sure. Um, and I think even if you had a full lexicon, it would still be complicated to fully, like you said, describe the richness of the experience. Yes, yes. Um, especially when there's such a non-physical nature to certain things. It's just hard to express the non-physical. It's very difficult. So um, before I keep going, because I wanted to keep going about the, the um, alter egos and such, where do your religious theological viewpoints lie? How do you view the universe? Um, well, I tell you, um, I have a friend named Robert Corrington, who's a philosopher, who's developed a philosophy called ecstatic naturalism. And his philosophy of ecstatic naturalism has been very useful to me. He sees 
the world and the universe, you might say, as uh, natural. That is, that is nature. There isn't anything beyond it. There isn't anything above nature. There isn't anything beyond nature. There's only nature, which is what is given to us. And what we have to do is explore nature. We can't get answers from the outside about nature because nature is all there is. So we have to use nature itself to understand it. And what Robert Corrington says, and what I think has a great deal of merit to it, is that there are two aspects of nature, what he calls nature naturing, which is the source of everything that exists, the unknowable, churning, powerful, endlessly fruitful source of what we see around us. And then there's nature natured, which is what we see around us, the things that we can say something about, the things that we can take pictures of, the things that we can think about, but we can't possibly exhaust the source. So nature he sees as being fissured into those two aspects, nature naturing the source and nature natured what it produces. And there are conditions that make the production of this world possible so that that source was able to produce the world in the particular way that it exists. So this is a philosophical system, which I have found very helpful. <clears throat> now, when I think about human depth, I think about the fact that the deeper we go into ourselves, the closer we get to, to our origin, to wherever it is that we emerge from the origin of the whole universe, that nature, nature. And so our great study, our great work, at least if you want to take up the challenge, is to see more and more about what happens when you move further or closer and closer going in the direction of the source. And so that is what I spend a lot of my time doing, trying to figure out and writing about, about that too. Okay. So you see it in, you used a lot of broader terms. You, you talk about it in terms of the source. The, um, so I, that reminds me of like a hermetic principle um, and the concept of the universe is mental. All is, all is in the mind of the all and the all is in all. Yes, yes, that's right. That, that, uh, it has a certain ring to it. It has a poetic power to it. It doesn't really be, take us very far, though, does it? I mean, it's, it, I like it. It's a nice way to picture things. It gives you a, a feeling. And, and that I don't, feelings are the ways we get in touch with reality. So that's important. But it, it also has tremendous limitations because it's so general as to help almost not be able to help us right. in, in actually living in this world. It seems like you have a really good balance between the practical and the impractical, the, the, the magical and the real. The Okay, yes, I think so. But I, let me tell you a little bit more about what I think in order to elucidate what you're talking about right now. Uh, in the book that I'm writing at the moment, I talk about what are called hypnagogic experiences. Now, the hypnagogic is a word that goes back about a century and a half. And it, it originally was used to describe that state between sleeping and waking that we all go through when we fall asleep and we come back through when we wake up. And that state is very different from our ordinary state and, and, and the ordinary world as we experience it. And the, the uh, inner dream state or the inner world as we experience it, so experience it. And the hypnagogic is, I've come to think, is more or less another way to talk about how we experience human depth. The hypnagogic images can come to us uh, when we're waking up or we're going to sleep, as I mentioned, but they come as images. They come, they come spontaneously. They're not imagination. They come from somewhere else, and we couldn't imagine producing these images ourselves. So they're coming from a depth within us that we have just about no knowledge of yet. And if we pay attention to the hypnagogic images we have, then we'll learn something about our depth. What I've seen also over the years is that we don't just have hypnagogic 
images when we're waking up or going to sleep. They'll come to us during the day also. We can have images. Well, you know this. I would say that, that when you talk about psychedelics, you're talking about hypnagogic images because those are not your ordinary state of consciousness. Neither are they sleep in, your, in its ordinary sense of the word, sleeping and dreaming. It's something else. I would put that in the category of the hypnagogic. So you think it's almost kind of an underlying thread to everything that's being held yes. together? I think that the that we I think that we go in and out of the experience of the ordinary world and the hypnagogic world. And they they overlap with each other in ways that we don't understand about very much about yet. This is where we need a lot of work of the naturalist. A lot of experiences, a lot of data to understand okay. how do they overlap and how do they interchange with each other. So there, we're we're just just barely at the beginning of exploring these things. And hypnagogic. So I, the book I've written and which will be published, um, it isn't yet published. Is called the land of hypnagogia, the land of the hypnagogia. Okay. So it's all about my experiences of life, of, of the inner life, and particularly of hypnagogia, hyp hypnagogic images. Now let me give you an example of a hypnagogic image, image that I had many years ago, probably 20 years ago. Um, when I got up one night to go to the bathroom, I went to the bathroom, the light was sort of bright in there. And I remember leaning on the sink and looking in, in the mirror. And then I closed my eyes. And I went from thinking thoughts that are ordinary, like you're going in the bathroom, you're finding your way around, you're thinking, oh, well, I'll go back to bed, you know, having all those kinds of thoughts. But as soon as I closed my eyes, I realized I was having thoughts and trains of thoughts and images that had nothing to do with the ordinary thinking of being awake. And there was one main image that I had there. And that was the image of that I was standing in front of a sloping hillside that was sloping away from me, up and away, very, very gradually. And I could see tremendous distances on this hillside. So the, the vista was very great. And what was going on on these hillside, this hillside was there were little places where things were happening, events were occurring, and they were all going on simultaneously. They all, each little event had its own coming, it had its own sequence and was in its own time, but they were all on this hillside simultaneously. Then between me and this hillside was a little railing and I looked down at the railing on the right, and I saw that there was a man standing on my side of the railing talking to this creature that was on the other side of the railing. In other words, that part of that vista. And this creature looked like if you would take, let's say, 20 layers of cardboard, laminate them, and then carve the edges of them, you know, you could carve a shape into that if you, if you did that with cardboard. Well, this looked like it was carved out of that kind of thing. And it had a kind of beak mouth and so forth. And it had, its eye was just a hole that had been punched through the cardboard. But this thing was talking to the, the guy down on my right. And this thing was saying to that guy, Brian, you don't know anything about what's really going on. And as I, as I saw this and listened to it, I realized that Brian was me. I mean, I was here, but I was also Brian over there. And now that to me is a very interesting image of what the world of hypnagogia is, the land of hypnagogia. It's where everything occurs that's not a part of the ordinary world. All of this is going on at the same time we're living in the ordinary world and we have no idea of it, no idea whatsoever. But that doesn't mean it isn't happening doesn't mean it isn't there and it isn't happening. And when I closed my eyes, I was immediately there. And when I opened my eyes, I was leaning on the sink, looking in the mirror. And then my thoughts were normal, if you see what I'm saying. Right. 
went back and forth. So I believe we, we shift in and out of the hypnagogic state constantly in life. But we, we've come to notice it more when we wake up and go from the, in that state between sleep and waking. We, we are more aware of it and say, whoa, that's, that's weird. This came to me or that came to me while I was waking up today. Right, right. So what it sounds like you're explaining is like um, like a celestial state or like a, another plane of being that's overlaps with this one, kind of an invisible plane of existence. You could look at it that way. I think planes of existence is one of the ways that people have tried to say something about this over the ages. Yes, planes of existence, levels of existence. And, and, and you're referring to it as, I want to make sure my terminology is correct, hypnogogic? Hypna, it's with an A. H-Y-P-N-A-G-O-G-I-C, hypnagogic. Hypnagogic. Which so, simply means, the Greek simply means going from, going leading to sleep, that which is leading to sleep. Okay. That's all it means. So um, I personally feel that my uh, hypnagogic visions uh, are more intense, they're thicker when I'm in a really creative space like if i've been yes. working really hard on writing jokes or working on skits whatever the thing is painting yep. it's like when i lay down to go to sleep um my mind's just it's on it's on overtime um and does it produce things for you yeah yeah mm -hmm. and it, it almost seems like it comes from another another place that's right that's it's, that's that's the nature of creativity it does come from another place but we'll never really know well, I don't say never, but we don't now really know what that other place is. Okay, and you don't. And you think that it comes from another place and not from within, from from depth within. No, that that is depth. Okay, there's nothing beyond that that's that's forming it. Okay. Except, well, I, I'm not saying there's no greater depth than us. I don't. I have no idea. There could be tremendous further depths that we don't even have a clue of that are forming these creative things, you see what I'm saying? I'm, but yeah. what, I, what I don't think is that you can explain this in terms of simplistic notions of the unconscious, taking ideas that we have during the day and putting them together and making, you know, creating new things. I don't think that's the nature of creativity at all. I think creativity comes from depth. It doesn't come from unconscious machinations of the brain. That'll well, never explain it for me. Yeah. and. Um, I I tend to agree with that, especially with all the nightmarish, crazy, hallucinatory dreams that I had as a child. Uh, yeah. It's like, there's no way, that none, none of that is born from a memory of something I had, you know? How far back do they go for you? Um, I, 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 I have different times where I remember them in different clarity. Um, you think they went back to when you were as early as five? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right, Ford. I think they were there at four. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. I think that's really interesting. And the fact that you were aware of it, and can you actually recall some of those things that came to you at four or five? Not in full detail, and you know. No, no, but you have some some sense of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, especially a recollection a recollection of the feeling associated with some of those dreams yes um yes it's very specific and it is i've never experienced it in any other place in my life um other than from those dreams and um i didn't experience that feeling for a good 20 something years and then here recently around like last october um i was having dreams for every other night for a couple of weeks that it, that's the only way I could describe it is that they reminded me of my dreams from childhood. There was just a certain essence of feeling about them. Yes. I couldn't quite put my finger on. Well, let me tell you, <clears throat> one of the things that I describe in the book is an experience I had when I was five years old, 1944, when I was old enough to read the funny, we called them the funnies or the comic strip in, in the newspaper. You know, they would have a few panels each, each day to these different strips. Well, there was one called Mandrake the Magician. Okay. It's quite a well-known old script now. I mean, it's looked upon as one of the earliest interesting comic strips. But anyway, it's about a magician named Mandrake, believe it or not. And uh, anyway, what I, what I remember is this one three panels that I saw one day in the paper. 
And in this panel, it, Mandrake has been given a solution that if you paint it on a mirror, you can walk through the mirror to the other side. Okay. okay? So he does that. He paints this solution on the mirror and he walks through the mirror to the other side. And then he's both out here and he's in there. And that's what they call, he, they call in the strip, the mirror world, the mirror world. And there everything is reversed. Uh, like his name is uh, Mandrake reversed. I can't pronounce it right now, but I mean, everybody's name is the same, but it's reversed. And they're the same, but they're not the same. People in the mirror world are not the same. They're kind of something sort of mysterious, something a little eerie, a little sinister about them. And when I read that at five years old, I, you know, I could hardly read, but I could read at five. Um, when I saw that, those three panels, I became so frightened because I realized by seeing those three panels, it was expressing a truth to me, and that is that this world is not just what I think it is here. There's doors and my, my room and the toys in it and stuff like that. There's something a lot different, and it's there all the time. And so I, if I think I know anything about the world, I don't. Right. And this, this unknown thing is so scary, not because it was evil, but because it was unknown. And so right. who, who in the world, you know, who could imagine what it might be? That was, that was one of my most powerful, formative hypnagogic experiences because I saw that, the mirror world, what I, I would now call the hypnagogic, what was the mirror world in Man Make, Mandrake the Magician. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, I, one, of, one of the things that I remember having dreams about a lot as a kid were, it was like a, a reoccurring nightmare where I was... Um, it was like I was trying to flee this haunted house, but every time I got out of the haunted house and off the property, the ghost, the demon, the monster, whatever it was, was still chasing me. Okay. Um, but that's something that, it, and now that I've gotten older um, and you go look at like, you know, shadow work and things like that, you start to realize that it's kind of your own personal demon, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's yeah, uh, I'm sure that's true. Yeah. It's depth. It's your subconscious it's, it's creating. Depth. That's right. And it's useful to know those things, that there is that, that we can create things like that for ourselves and they express something that, that needs to be expressed about our experience of life thus far. Um, when I talk about depth of the unconscious not helping or the unconscious being misleading, the, the, no, the word the unconscious being misleading, I don't mean that it's not useful. I do think that it's therapeutic understanding such as you're describing like a Jungian notion of shadow. I think those are useful. They do give us something. They, they do have a way of organizing our experiences that are helpful. But what I've been concerned become much more concerned about is everything else that's below that. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it sparks curiosity to say the least. <laughs> um sometimes i wonder if it would be easier to just play ignorance is bliss and not be like you or i and ask all these strange questions and just kind of kick the soccer ball around in the backyard <laughs> i don't know maybe i could never do that i could never be anything else or have any other way of looking at things you know i, I couldn't say oh well i'll just have to put this aside now and live a so-called normal life <laughs> right i could never do that i could never do that at any point it's and like you're I, so enamored with the mystery now like i can't walk away yeah. from it yeah that's right and you know what what more could you want except something absolutely intriguing that's endless right right it is endless and it's pure it's very pure yeah um all right so i wanted to go back and keep going on this article that she wrote sure. so one of the things that i really liked from the article um i i I enjoy Hinduism, um, the idea of the Brahman, um, the idea that we're all we're all extensions of the universe. It's just playing roles through us based on our memories and our experiences. Um, that article that you guys wrote kind of spoke on that because it was, I think the quote was, 
um, we could all be altars, you know, dissociative identities of a universal consciousness. Um, do you believe in that? Do you believe in a collective consciousness? I think that there's something to be said for that that explanation. I think I think uh, that Bernard uh, Kastrup, who is one, the, the main author of that, uh, thought that that formulation was useful. I think that formulation could be useful for many people, and I think it does represent quite a Hindu approach to things. And I think there's a lot in Hinduism and the Hindu metaphysics that's useful. And it has certain relationship to what I mentioned earlier about ecstatic naturalism. I think the, the turning source is Atman, I mean, is Brahman. Okay. And what comes out of it are a bunch of examples of Atman or Brahman expressed in human beings, right? In various human beings. And so these are all, you could see these as alter personalities of some main personality. So I think there's a usefulness in that. I think it, it is more or less a restatement in a different way of, of the Hindu way of looking at things. I think you're right about that. Yeah, um, so that's what I wanna talk about next. So do you think that, because uh, 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 that paper at least, a lot of these ideas, they're not unheard of or taboo in Eastern thought. So do you think it's really Western society that needs to be open to these concepts? Well, you know, I think that it's true that that kind of depth that comes from Hindu thought or from some Buddhist thought, I think is, is not, doesn't have a counterpart in the West, although the West has taken it on, taken it on now. In the last 150 or 200 years, the West has opened itself to these ideas from the East. But I think that when we find these ideas in the West, they largely have migrated from the East. Um, I'm not saying absolutely that that's the truth. I don't know enough about the history to say there are no elements of it before that migration, but uh, at least a lot of things come from the East that express those ways of seeing things. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, I, I could not stop thinking about that while I was uh, mm -hmm. reading this article. Cause I love, I'm a big fan of Alan Watts. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, and he has a lot of lectures that are kind of uh, of this nature. And it talks about yeah. that concept that the world is a stage. Yes. And, and that we are all masks, personas of the, the Brahmin. Um, and that is how the Hindus view the world, that it's a play. Yeah. And I, as I say, I think that that's a useful formulation. I think that it's very close to ecstatic naturalism. I think all, all the deepest formulations of the nature of reality have some way of putting the same thing that you're, that you're saying right now. But they can you know, they use different images, different... Uh, points of reference, but there is some feeling abroad in, in humanity that there's this source, this origin, and then there are all the things that come from it that have, that, that actually have, they emanate, they come from that source. Right. And then also give back to that source. Yes, that's, a, that, that's another question. Yeah. Um, cause a, a hermetic, a hermetic belief is that, um, uh, Terrence McKenna put it, uh, God, God walked off the stage of creation with it 90% done and left it in the hands of his brothers that in the hermetic principle that it refers to humanity as the brother of God, um, which I think rings true to a lot of Abrahamic religions. It's, you know, you're, you're created in my image, um, but that it's, part of our reason for being here is to help create this reality, to help finish creating this reality. It's, um, it's a co-creation. I think that's a, there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. Um, it, and that's the thing about all of this is there's no knowing, is there? It's, it's only speculation. Oh, no. There's no knowing. And, and we have to recognize the diversity of expression of some of these basic ideas that, that diversity is okay, you know? Each diversity brings in a, another aspect that, that may be useful. Right, a different perspective, a different yeah. angle. Yeah. 
which is very important i think um yeah. perspective yeah. is so important all right um yeah actually um i have written down here when the doors of perception are cleansed things will appear to man as they truly are infinite um perception is what separates us well, there's a reason i wrote that down i think it's because uh, i think it was uh in relation to idealism is, is why I wrote that. Um, I think our individual perceptions and experiences and memories are what shape are what separate us and give us that sense of like individuality. And we're all having these individual um, experiences. But the way that I see it is that it's all the same fabric. It's, it's infinite. There is a collective consciousness. It's just, we're all receiving different, drips of it you know we're, we're all hooked up to an iv and we're all getting different doses at different times mm -hmm. yeah i don't have any problem with that idea i believe that whenever we say i we're affirming that because right you say i and i say i and we don't mean the same thing but we do mean the same thing right right um okay all right i think i'm I think I've got everything about the article that I wanted to ask you about. I've I got a couple more questions, Adam, I wanted to ask you. Thank you for doing this, by the way, again. Sure. Um, can you tell me about the alternate consciousness paradigm? I was oh, reading yes. that on your website. Yeah. Um, what I'm doing there, see, when I was in high school, I hated history. Hated it. Didn't want to take it and so forth. Thought, thought it was useless. But all of my writings have been historical. It's a, kind of an irony that that's the way it's ended up. So one of the things I was trying to figure out is how did, uh, how did the West become what it is in terms of having developed this thing called psychodynamic therapy, the notion that we have an unconscious mind, that it's dynamic and works in us, and it works outside of our ordinary consciousness and expresses itself in things that we do or feel but also in dreams and so forth. That's, that's a Western, that's a Western thing. That's a Western contribution. But the East doesn't have really anything comparable to that. That is a practical psychotherapy, a practical framework in which you can explore that unconscious. So that's a good thing. And it began in, 19, in 1780, 1784 when the Marquis de Puiseguer wrote his first book, he was a follower of Franz Anton Mesmer, the Marquis de Puiseguer, and he wrote this book about, about animal magnetism or mesmerism. And he talked about artificial somnambulism, artificial sleepwalking. That was the beginning of the recognition that we have an unconscious. And he explored that. And then ever since then, people have explored that notion that began with him on a particular day in 1784. And today, what all the psychotherapies that, that recognize or all the cultural, cultural expressions that recognize the notion that we have an unconscious mind come from that, come from that spring of 1784. So I wrote about that. And I wrote about that as an origin. A very important origin. Now, what was your question again? I, I really was just trying to get you to explain what it was because I didn't have an okay. idea. Well, the, so that's right. I'm, I'm remembering you, you're saying uh, the alternate consciousness paradigm. Yes, sir. I, I, what I say in my writings in various places is that Huishigur, this man that I told you about in 1784, started a new paradigm, a new way of understanding human behavior. Before then, there had been two principal ways. One is we can understand human behavior as a physiological thing and that the, what's going on in the body is central to what people do. Another way of understanding things, particularly understanding why we do things that we don't like to do, why do we do things that we disapprove of doing, you know, why we are at odds with ourselves, is that we are possessed or, or influenced by a sorcerer, something from the outside. 
Now the first paradigm where it's the body is what I call the organic paradigm. Second paradigm where it's something from the outside I call the intrusion paradigm, something coming in from the outside that makes us do these things. And, and when Pushy Gear came across, or came along, he said, no, it's, it's, he didn't say this, but it, it developed out of his thinking. It's, it's neither of those. We in ourselves have something that creates a whole set of actions and responses that we know nothing about. And that's why we say and do things we don't approve of. That's why we are a mystery to ourselves. Not because somebody's doing it to us, making us do these things. The devil made me do it, you know. Not because the body's humors are out of balance, but because there's something at work in us on this level of what he called artificial somnambulism or the level that we've come to call the unconscious in the West. And so that's what I call the unconscious paradigm, the third paradigm. It originated right at that point and it developed. It didn't come out full blown. It took decades for it to develop, finally realizing fruition in, uh, in the French writer named Pierre Genet, who wrote about this from the magnetic tradition, wrote about the notion of a subconscious mind and about dissociation. Pierre Genet is the person who um, developed the notion, the meaning for dissociation that we use today when we call dissociative disorder. That's from his language. So he's the one who brought it to fruition and that, that he did in 1887. Now, in other words, a century after Prisigur, it had developed to what we now recognize as a kind of state of uh, things for human beings that they have an unconscious mind and that we need to understand that there's a lot going on in us that we consciously don't know and find it very difficult to access. Okay. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> That's really interesting though. Um, all right, thank you for explaining that to me or at least trying to explain that to me. Uh, <laughs> um, what is your, uh, we talked about, we already talked about animal magnetism quite a bit. Um, I mean, we talked about it, but not in those terms. For people who don't know, animal magnetism is the belief that an invisible natural force um, kind of possesses all things, uh, humans, animals, plants. Yes, basically it's a healing system developed by Mesmer. And, <clears throat> He believed that every th the universe is pervaded by a fluid, magnetic fluid. This is what makes living things alive, that they, this fluid flows through them and gives them life to their organism. And that's why it's called animal magnetism. Animal simply means living things. Okay. Right? So magnetic fluid would be the fluid of life in living things. Now, Pushy Gear was taught by Mesmer, so he went out, to, he was developing healing. He was doing healing when, when he started, physical healing. But as soon as he started to use it, he saw that some of the people he was using these techniques on were going into a different state where they seemed to be asleep, but they weren't asleep. You could communicate with them. And that's what he came to call artificial somnambulism or magnetic somnambulism. And that's the beginning of understanding that we have an unconscious mind. Okay. This is all really interesting stuff, Adam. Um, so uh, what's your what's your main interest right now? Um, that's the 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 hypnagogic the hypnagogic yes. right? The hypnagogic and also seeing ourselves as naturalists. Yeah, I really like that. I Not as spinners of theories and models, but the naturalists who are, who are collecting this data for a future science. Right, because like we were talking about earlier with all this mystery about um, the only thing that you can really be sure of is the here and the now, right? Yeah. So you feel it's important to document, record that here and now um, so that we can look at it and have that information of the experiences. The exactly, exactly. You know, there's a poem written by Friedrich Nietzsche. Okay. He wrote this poem. He said, where you're standing, dig, dig out. 
down below is the well. Let those who dwell in darkness shout, down below there's hell. So what he's saying is, you, you explore life, you find out about everything, just where you are. You don't have to go somewhere else. You dig where you're standing, dig down, and you'll find all this fruitful and rich um, vein of things down in that well. People who don't understand that say, don't dig, don't dig, because down below there's hell, so avoid it. Okay. Keep your eyes closed. Too dangerous. So uh, <laughs> it sounds like a, a quote that encourages meditation. Yeah. I mean, that's how that's at least how I interpret it. That's the, yes. fun, that's the fun thing about all of this is we all get to interpret it however we want. Yes. Um, that's from one of his books called The Joyful Wisdom. Most people don't realize that Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's philosophy was joyful. It really was. Really? He, re he lived a kind of miserable life, but his philosophy was not a miserable philosophy. Anyway, okay. that's a whole other story. You no, know, um, but you're saying that the look within um, and that some people will interpret that as, as hell. Uh, yeah, and, yes. Yeah, and I like that too, especially in relation to speaking about meditation because a lot of, um, a lot of Western religions will tell you that meditation and uh, trying to get in touch with your chakras, raise your kundalini, that things like that are satanic. Um, when, yes. you know, in Hindu and Eastern thought, they're very, it's a very spiritual thing. Yes. Um, it's, it's a look within thing. It's a depth thing. Yeah. So it's funny how it gets interpreted as hell. Yes, that's right. I mean, a lot of what I'm writing about in, in the book that I'm publishing is about depth and about fear or dread of depth. Okay. And it's the dread or fear of depth, not because there's something bad there, but because we don't understand it. And so we feel like we can't trust it and, and it, it probably is dangerous. So we can project all of our fears, all of our <laughs> unresolved conflicts onto it and fear, the, fear it and say, don't go near it. Right. But that's not because that's not because that's the nature of human death. There's nothing to fear there. It's just what it is. Right. It's just your for lack of a better term, your ego probably wants to remain swimming on the surface. Because yes. that's where that's, that's where thing. it remains strong. That's the way to may, remain strong and also to remain dead. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well two more things, Adam, and I'll let you go. I'm sure you're a busy man. Um I wanted to ask you about subliminal resources. I guess that's kind of yes. everything we're talking about now, isn't it? Looking within. Subliminal resources. I wrote a book called Memoir of a Trans Therapist. Um, and in that book, I write about my experience of being a psychotherapist that uses a lot of trans states. Okay. And what I've come to realize in studying trans states is that trans states are access to the hypnagogic their access to our depth. And it's in our depth where our resources are. So by human, by inner resources or human resources that we get to and translate, I mean everything that's in our depth, which includes everything really worthwhile, including all the great creativity, um, urges and, and uh, inclinations that we have. They all come from the depth and they all are created precisely because they can, come from the depth. You cannot produce a great work of art on any, from anything except the deepest part of yourself that's available to you. That's beautiful. So do you think there's a core, I don't know how much you studied uh, mysticism, the occult, things like that. Do you think there's a correlation between um, trance states and like ceremonial magic? Um, Yes. And locations and things like that. Yes, I wrote another book called Trans Zero. Okay. Okay, I'm getting my books in here now. <laughs> no, that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, Trans Zero, and there I describe what I see as the essence of what trance is. And what? Just repeat the question. Sorry, it slipped away. Um, do you think there's a correlation between trance states and like um, rituals done in ceremonial yes. magic? I believe that trance states are part of everyday life. And I believe that everything we do, to do it, we go into a trance state. Okay. According to my definition of trance, and it's my own definition of trance. 
my own definition of trance is that it's a state of focus on something and, it, and sort of diminishing awareness of everything else. And this focus draws out of us resources to deal with the thing we're focused on. So an actor, a comedian, right. you get on the stage and you are going to a trance state in my meaning of the word trance. Because when you're there, you're focused on doing this thing of, of your act and of reaching these people out there and of finding a way to make them uh, see the, the funny aspects of life that you see. Right? right, to show them my perspective. So you're totally focused on that. While you're up there on the stage, you're focused on that and you're aware of the audience as part of that focus, right? You've got to be. But everything else is gone. So you're not you're not thinking about what you're going to buy at the grocery store that night, right? You're not thinking of what what your friend said to you the other day. You're not thinking of anything except this particular activity and involvement. So we constantly go in and out of trances of that kind. You you know if you thread a needle, it's a trance right. because you've got to focus very much right. to get that thread through there. Everything else has got to go away while you do that. And it immediately comes back, of course, when you got the thread through. Right. And so you dissociate the rest of yourself from everything else. It's just thread and exactly. needle. That's right. And we do that all the time. If you're reading a book, you know, you can, you can, if you're writing on a subway or something like, a, like I used to before the plague, um, you know, if you're reading a book, you, you can go by your stop without realizing it because you're so focused in the book. Right, right. Everything else is gone. You just have a little bit preliminary or uh, peripheral awareness of other things like people sitting there in the sound and all that. You know all that, but you're not, it's almost irrelevant because you're into to a different focus than all those things. So I believe that in everyday life, we're constantly going in and out of trance states. Okay. I, I, and you're and definitely right. Access. But access is your inner resources. Sorry. Right. No, no, you're fine. Um, I, I believe that's true too. Especially what you say about um, performing comedy, but not just performing those, those creative states. Um, it's very yes. trance like, it's like, I don't, I, I almost don't know where this is coming from. Exactly. That's right. It's a creative thing for you and you can't do it unless you're in touch with your death. You, you know, Nijinsky, the ballet dancer, the, I don't know if you know, he was a Russian ballet dancer, one of the most famous male ballet performers ever. Okay. But he was also unfortunately psychotic and he spent some time in mental institutions. But he said, when I'm dancing, I'm in a trance. He said, a trance of love, I'm God. <laughs> he was right. Yeah. He described it. He described it. And so people would look at that and say, the guy's crazy. Right. Well, he happened to be right. Right. At the same time. Um, wow. It, so there, I like that story. There's a, I, I can never remember what it is, but there's like a religion or a culture that believes that existence is a dance, that, that the, the universe is a song and a dance. We're all yeah. kind of doing it together. You and I are singing right now. Yeah. Um, that's beautiful. There yeah. is a, the more you pay attention to it, the more you start to notice that it's very creative and childlike in nature, the universe, God, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Yeah, that's true. It seems to be. All right, Adam, um, two more things. First thing, um, books. What, what book of yours do you recommend oh. um, the most? What, what, what do okay. you think is the most important one to read? Okay, I'm best known for a book called From Mesmer to Freud. Yes. Magnetic Sleep and the Roots of Psychological Healing. That's one book. I'm, I'm well known for that. It's an academic type book, a historical type book. Um, my most recent one is called Evolutionary Love and the Ravages of Greed. Evolutionary and is, Love and the, and the Ravages, ravages of Greed. This is, this is a book about the nature of love. Okay. And the fact that we have, there are two kinds of love abroad in the universe. One is called agape or sort of a uh, unconditional love. 
and the other is called eros, which is love that seeks to be en enriched by another. It's a very different thing. Okay. Uh, but when, when eros takes over and pushes out agape, then we have greed, because then people just want to be enriched and don't have any notion of the benefit of the loved object. Okay. That's so it's good. just it's just getting enriched for the sake of getting enriched. Exactly. Not to use it to enlighten others to raise your own vibration. That's right. So erotic love, I'm not talking about sexual love here. Right. But erotic love in this sense, the, the desire to be increased and, and, and improved from, from our relation to the love object, that is good, but it's got to be balanced by agape. Okay. So that's one book. It's called Evolutionary Love and the Ravages of Greed. There is my book, Trans, uh, Memoir of a Trans Therapist, that I mentioned to you. Okay. There's Trans Zero, which is for- I'm about to book. order that one. Yeah, okay. It's, it's my for earliest and simplest explanation of trans states. Okay. <clears throat> there is, um, uh, my first book is called M Multiple Man. All right. Uh, multiple man studies in possession and multiple personality. Okay. And uh, the one I'm writing right now is called The Land of Hypnagogia. Soon to appear on your, on your uh, internet. Okay, wonderful. Keep, keep an eye out for that, everybody. Um, and then, Adam, you're a smart man. You, you have a vast knowledge of human consciousness. Um, I'm sure you have a knowledge of sociology and culture as well. Um, you're a smart man. Uh, our news networks aren't smart enough to have someone like you on to speak to the masses. So if you were, if you were put in the Rose Garden right now and given the ability to speak to everyone at once, what would you say, Adam? I would talk about the the predicament we're in right now, the, the world, the world yeah. is in right now. And I would say the basics of the problem is not a particular man you know, who's causing all of this. Uh, the basis of all this trouble is a kind of uh, corruption that's set into society at, at large. The United States, certainly. I grew up in the United States. It was different when I grew up. Right. But now what has happened is the notion of truth has disappeared or has it lost its importance. And so I see two problems. There's a kind of laziness because people are not actually taking the time to try to think for themselves and come to their own conclusions. They're looking for someone to say, here's what you should think. Here's a way to look at this. And so, well, this guy, I like the way this guy looks, so I'll think that way and I'll accept this. And that's what I call laziness. Yeah, and it creates a lack of depth. That's right. And the other is the uh, devaluation of truth. The notion of truth now has become, I mean, what do you say to your children when you realize that politicians are constantly, every day of their lives, lying, knowingly lying, or deceiving in some way or other? Politics has become... I couldn't believe, I can't, can hardly believe how corrupt it has become. Lying is okay. Um, and it's not just because we had a great teacher. It's because it's already was there in society. It already was waiting to be released. So these are huge problems. And I think that any notion that you can solve these problems from the top down is mistaken. They have to come, it has to come from a changing in attitude at the grassroots. Mm -hmm. And I see some of that happening now with, with the protests that have happened to be going on right now as you and I are talking. There's something happening in the grassroots. I haven't felt it. I thought it would take a lot longer, but there's something happening in the grassroots and it seems to be a kind of convergence of corruption everywhere so that people are sick with it and sick up it, uh, and this tremendous life-threatening state that the whole world is now experiencing, that is the pandemic. So <clears throat> it looks like this is bringing out 
not so much the worst in people, it's bringing out more of the, of the best in people. And I think this is a grassroots kind of thing that's needed to have a different future. I like that. I like that. I, th I, I think you're right too. I've been preaching that a lot on my end that it does, it starts from the bottom up. It starts yeah. with self. Yeah. Um, and then we can really truly experience change on a massive scale. Yes. Because yeah. um, if, if you believe that it's a, a broken system and that it's a, a power struggle, then trying to fix it from the top down just isn't going to work. It isn't going to work. No. It's just going to lace up that boot even stronger against you. Yes. True. <laughs> um, and I think another thing that people should understand is, you know, uh, these news organizations and social media organizations and Burger King and Target and all, they all have people like you, uh, psychotherapists, uh, psychologists, uh, sociologists working with their marketing departments, understanding how we think and how our minds work and trying to uh, manipulate that and take advantage of that. Yes. So, so it's definitely important to look within, have some depth, don't accept things for face value. Yes, I agree. Adam, this was great talking to you. I really appreciate you doing this. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Um, I hope that I can help you sell some books. And I'm definitely, I'm personally going to go check out this book um, that we talked about. Trans Zero. Trance Zero, The Psychology of Maximum Experience. And that's that's about uh, trance states. So I'm definitely excited to check that out. Adam, thank you so much for doing this. You have a beautiful night. Um, you are. You may, maybe I can have you back sometime. Sure. Sure. Great. I'll talk to you later, bud. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.